Hi there, good evening. I'm Jordan McGee, Director of Education here at the National Atomic Testing Museum. On behalf of our Board of Trustees and staff, I want to welcome you all and thank you so much for choosing to spend your evening with us here this evening. I have here, if you don't have it already, a new copy of our lecture flyer. We've added a couple of speakers to it probably since you saw it last. In fact, I know we have because I added one about two hours ago. <laughs> so you probably don't have it yet. And so just a couple of quick notes on the schedule. Our next lecture after tonight will be on Friday, April 12th, and that will be with the president of the test site managing contractor, Mission Support and Test Services, Mark Martinez and he will be here talking about the mission of the test site and the programs that are ongoing out there currently. And then a couple of scheduling notes. We've moved um, Dr. Vince Houghton's lecture to Saturday, June 1st. That had previously been at the end of May. Now it will be on Saturday, June 1st. And then the one I added this afternoon is Saturday, November 16th, and that will be with Francis Gary Powers, Jr the son of Francis Gary Powers, who was the famous U-2 pilot shot down during the Cold War. So again, this is out in the lobby. If you need an updated copy, of course, it will be online and in our newsletter as well. Now, on to tonight's speaker. Alan B. Carr currently serves as the senior historian for Los Alamos National Laboratory. During his tenure as laboratory historian, Alan has produced several publications pertaining to the Manhattan Project nuclear weapons testing, and the laboratory's development during the Cold War years. He has lectured for numerous professional organizations and has been featured as a, as a guest on many local, national, and international radio and television programs. Before coming to Los Alamos, Alan completed his graduate studies at Texas Tech University in Lubbock. Please join me in welcoming Alan Carr. Hey, thank you, Jordan. Hello. Hey, all right. It's so good to be here tonight. I appreciate the invitation, and thank you for making the trip to be out here. This is a cool story. I think you're all really going to enjoy it. Uh, even in Los Alamos, the story of the Rover program is almost forgotten. So we're going to bring it back to life tonight, right? Because it's Friday night in Las Vegas. Yes. And so. Um, if, you're, if you don't know about the Rover program or much about it, I'm actually going to take a break. And, uh, and I should warn you, this is a, uh, the whole talk is going to run the better part of an hour and a half. It is a long talk, but there's lots of cool stuff and we're going to have fun. I am going to take a break, though, and let uh, uh, show you this video to introduce you to the program. Sometime in the 1970s, a super rocket, taller than a 20-story building, will be blasted into an orbit of the Earth from somewhere in the United States of America. It will be manned by astronauts who will have been trained for years for this mission. When its boosters drop away, burn up, and fall harmlessly to Earth, the main rocket will be guided by these men to an important rendezvous. They will stabilize their craft in a parking orbit around the Earth. And after precision checks of the actual orbit and an inspection of the space vehicle, the space travelers will sit back and wait for a highly critical moment, a precise point in time and space when their powerful engine will snatch them from the pull of Earth's gravity and hurl them along their way. And at that moment, man's age-old dream of touching a star will start to become a reality. For this will be a manned mission to a celestial body, most probably the red planet, Mars. The engine that will make possible such a far outreach into the heavens will derive its great energy and efficiency from the power of the tiniest bit of matter, the nucleus of the atom. Such an engine is now being designed and developed, and this is the story of that engine. But uh, Elon Musk, Vladimir Putin, we did this stuff a long time ago. And it worked. 
as you're going to see. And uh, we'll talk about why this never came to fruition, but I love this stuff. Uh, one other thing, if you're thinking, you know, that is a really cool video. I sure do wish that I could see the rest of it. I have good news for you. I have posted it on my personal YouTube page. So look up Alan B. Carr YouTube, and it's one of the approximately 30 films that I put on there. And you'll be able to see the best line in the film. So the guy that you heard talking there, kind of the prelude is 1945. The atomic age is ushered in. Now, nothing is impossible. <laughs> what an incredible time it must have been to live in back there. Nothing was impossible, not even going to Mars. And this was years and years, decades ago. So let's, uh, let's go back in time here and uh, let's see. I will use the arrow keys. Probably forgot to turn this on or something. Oh, we saw that. Okay, so uh, of course for this to be, I, I do work for the government. Uh, thus, I have to include an organizational chart. And <clears throat> so this, is, this was a big national uh, project. Rover, of course, was just the Los Alamos portion of it. But you can see this, uh, this is from probably the late 19, uh, very late 1950s, maybe early 1960s. You can see the Atomic Energy Commission up there in the Marshall Space Center, uh, NASA, all of those things. You get down here, these are the organizations that are trying to build nuclear rockets, including us with, as you can see, our stylish logo from that era. So why would you, uh, well, I should start out by, by asking. Everybody's heard the cliche, it's not rocket science right? You think rocket science is hard. Let's try a nuclear rocket science instead. Now, my, uh, my good personal friend, Dick Malenfant up here, he explains why this makes sense. Because if you're going to build a nuclear rocket to carry somebody to Mars, get them home, that's going to be very, very challenging. So there's got to be a big payoff. The payoff is it's incredibly efficient. If you can make one of these work, you can do a lot more with it than you can do with standard chemical rockets. And uh, we'll hear from Dick Malenfant in just a, a little bit. He's still uh, doing great. He lives uh, outside of Denver. And hopefully he'll get to visit here and talk with you one of these days. Just a little bit of background here. So we saw the Goddard Space Flight Center mentioned on the org chart. Well, of course, it's named after Robert Goddard, who you see there. Isn't it interesting that he was thinking about using some kind of nuclear process for propulsion in the 19-teens? Pretty cool. And of course, he was the one who invented chemical uh, rockets as we know them today. Now, as you might imagine, leading up to the, the, uh, the World War II in Europe, in the interwar years, not a whole lot of thought was given to this. It, it didn't seem like... It didn't seem practical, uh, for one thing. Of course, even if you could do this, wh what would you use it for uh, that you can't already just get, again, chemicals and things like that instead? So it looked really hard. It didn't look that practical. Goddard even kind of gives up on the, uh, on the idea and, and does move into chemicals instead. Now, we get into World War II. And a little bit of historical context here, because we have to keep the proceedings moving along. But in World War II, we're not interested in a nuclear rocket at all. Nobody's thinking about it. Why? Well, because the war is going on. And again, to put that war into context just a little bit, you know, back, we think about the Manhattan Project. The people of the Manhattan Project, Los Alamos, and all of the other sites as well, produced two entirely different types of nuclear weapons in about 28 months or so, approximately. That's pretty amazing as well, isn't it? And people will ask me, could the lab do something like that again today? And of course, the, the knee-jerk reaction is to say, well, no, we couldn't do that. We can't even change a light bulb anymore. The, the thing is, I think the lab could. I think the labs th that we have in this country could do something like that again. But the reason why we were able to do the things that we did in World War II is because 300 plus Americans were being killed in combat every single day of World War II. We've not seen a national crisis like that since. And so, yeah, we could do something like that again, but I hate to think of the catalyst that might cause us to put safety as job number three or four, which it was back during the Manhattan Project days. Of course, World War II, we were lucky to only lose that many people. The Soviet Union, which had helped start the war in the first place before Hitler broke their non-aggression pact, uh, the Soviet Union lost 15 to 20,000 people every day. 
So we're not interested in, in nuclear rocketry during World War II. We've got other problems. Uh, after the war's over, people start thinking about this uh, stuff again a little bit. But the, the big problem, and I'll play this uh, silent film for you while we're going through this. The big problem at this point in time, though, is, well, look, even if you could do this, why? Why would you do it? Well, I mean, this is super hard and going to be expensive, and we're not going to pay for it just because it's cool. So this is where our issue comes in. We get to, uh, what you're seeing there is a film of Castle Bravo. Most of you in this room probably know that Castle Bravo was the most powerful nuclear test that the United States ever, ever performed. That's a thousand little boys in a deliverable case. So this is an exceptionally powerful weapon. The problem with these early hydrogen bombs were that they were really big and really heavy. And the only way that you could get them to, the, to an enemy target was in an airplane. So I don't know about you, but that's not a job I would want. Yeah, let's, let's fly a gigantic lumbering bomber with a 40,000-pound bomb on it to try and bomb Moscow. I don't want any part of that. These are a couple of my colleagues that work with me at Los Alamos. Uh, John Moore there, Madeline Whitaker, they're, they're both archivists and historians at the laboratory. They're standing in front of a Mark 17 bomb. Are we going to be able to deliver that with chemicals? No, they're thinking about ballistic missiles and things like that. But you're not going to be able to, to use chemicals, conventional chemicals, to deliver a really big hydrogen bomb like that against our adversaries. But what if you had a nuclear rocket? Hmm, now that, that's, uh, that's going to give us a reason maybe to, uh, to build one of these things. Now, before we continue down, uh, down that path, a little bit more Cold War context. Isn't it a shame people don't remember the Cold War? You know, World War II was the most violent and deadly war in history. I think the Cold War was the most dangerous. You know, you think about the stakes. You think about the nature of our adversary, the Soviet Union, right? Uh, this, these were very dangerous times. And it looked like in the 50s that we weren't doing that well against the Soviets. Now, of course, the Soviets, because... Uh, uh, part of my contract, I do get to, don't have to, I get to badmouth the Soviet Union just a little bit. Now, as I mentioned really quickly in passing a while ago, remember, they helped Hitler start World War II. They not only signed a non-aggression pact uh, with, with the Nazis, but after the Germans invaded Poland, the Soviet Union invaded Poland 17 days later. They took half of that country and never gave it back. I know you're shocked, right? Uh, after that, they attacked Finland. They annexed portions of Finland as well. They forcefully annexed about 20% of Romania. They annexed Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. Now, the thing is, and this is how I feel, but when people use the term paranoia to describe how we felt against the Soviets, you know, paranoia is an unjustified fear, right? I think we had a good reason to be afraid, especially considering that arguably history's greatest mass murderer, Joseph Stalin, was presiding over all of this. And so again, because we're going quickly, hopefully, uh, I imagine you all know, the Berlin blockade is when Cold War tensions really begin to ramp up. And uh, of course, I imagine one reason that Harry Truman had no problem sending planes over Soviet territory to resupply our people in Berlin was because we had nuclear weapons and they didn't. Huh? But that didn't last forever. So after, shortly after, only a few months after the end of the Berlin blockade, the Soviet Union, uh, they test an atomic bomb as well. And not only do they test an atomic bomb, they test a copy of Fat Man. We find out about that in the, uh, in the 1950s. So the Chi China's proclaimed a, a communist country in 1949. The fighting ultimately ends in 1950. But China's a communist country that same year. The Korean War starts in 1940, uh, or in 1950, I should say, as well. We find out again about how the Soviets got help building that first atomic weapon. And I, I don't want to badmouth the Soviet Union there, although espionage isn't really cool when it's committed against you, uh, right, as it was there. They had lots of good scientists. They had really good scientists in the Soviet Union. Uh, but uh, the thing was, remember, the industrialized portion of their country had basically been obliterated in World War II, and they lost as many as 27 million people. Uh, that, too, is pretty uh, incredible that they were able to make an atomic bomb in only four years after the United States did. But they had the plans. Little side story here for you. One time I had to, I almost got fired for this. Uh, nobody, remember, what stays in Vegas, right? <laughs> 
I got to tour some uh, of our Russian friends around the laboratory uh, one evening who were visiting, and they had a translator, and so I would talk to the translator. We drove past the building at Los Alamos that has the, uh, all of our archival, our permanent records in it, going all the way back and including the World War II records. And I looked at the translator and I said, hey, tell them all the original documentation for our nuclear weapons program and theirs is in that building. They didn't translate that. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, as we continue on, the Soviets have an atomic bomb uh, now. And again, they don't, it's, it's not just an atomic bomb. It's not just a copy of ours. But now Joseph Stalin has an atomic bomb as well. Uh, and of course, as the 50s progressed, these fears, uh, which were totally legitimate, were stoked by the bomber gap. We thought the Soviets had 800, 1,000 atomic bombers that were going to fly over the North Pole and destroy us. The, uh, the missile gap, we thought they had more and better missiles. And Sputnik, which I will only mention in passing for now, but Sputnik is going to be an important part uh, of our story as we, as we go through it. So next, let's go back to building nuclear rockets. What you see up there, you see a, a couple of Manhattan Project veterans, Los Alamos uh, Manhattan Project veterans. So John von Neumann, famous Hungarian mathematician, he was at the heart of the implosion program at Los Alamos during World War II. After the war, he became an advisor to the Air Force. The Air Force is interested in delivering hydrogen bombs, big, giant, heavy hydrogen bombs, maybe using means other than a big, lumbering, heavy bomber. So he thinks, well, the, this nuclear rocket business that people have talked about, I think I may have an application for it. Now, his advisory panel to the Air Force included another project veteran from uh, Los Alamos, Daryl Froman. So Froman's in charge of the reactor division at Los Alamos. So you can kind of see where this is going. These guys start talking about the uh, possibility of building a nuclear rocket engine. Now, there's one issue, though. Los Alamos, at that point in time, was a nuclear weapons lab. We did almost nothing besides nuclear weapons at that point in time. Of course, today, we're a, 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 a multidisciplinary institution. Back then, we did nukes and a couple of other things that were kind of for nukes anyway, right? So what's the director going to think when we come to him and say, well, we want to get into the delivery system business? Actually, the, the, the director at the time, who our museum is named after, Norris Bradbury, he thought, this is a pretty good idea. Not only is it cool and useful and nuclear weapons related, but, uh, you know, we probably should start technically diversifying the laboratory because nuclear weapons might go away at some point. Or at least the research, all the effort that we put into it, may get a lot easier. So that's the thought. We'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. So that's how this program starts. It becomes, uh, well, initially, it's just a little group. So Froman comes back, sets up a little group. They're going to call it the Condor Committee. We're going to get together, talk about this stuff a little bit. Uh, that next year, in April of 1955, less than half a year after the Condor Committee was established, Norris makes this a division level activity. He creates the Nuclear Rocket Propulsion Division, and it is led by yet another Project Y veteran, Raymer Schreiber, who you see over there. Uh, Schreiber has kind of been lost to time. We, we, some of us still know him uh, well back in Los Alamos. I think though a documentary was recently made, so you might look that up if you'd like to learn more about him. He really did have an interesting career and played a big part in, in our history. Now, remember, we're going to build a nuclear rocket. We've got a division to do it. The reason we're going to make this thing is to deliver hydrogen bombs. We want, an IC, we want a nuclear ICBM, OK? So, uh, so anyway, they start out with a prototype. This was called Old Black Joe. And to my knowledge, this never made it off paper. And I know that there are people, that's, I've got to be careful what I say, because we do have rover veterans in our midst today. And so there may be many corrections at the end of the presentation. But anyway, this is going to be a 1500 megawatt graphite reactor because we want to start small, right? <laughs> that's a pretty significant reactor, right? And so that's where we're going to start. Uh, let me see what we've got next. Let's go back and talk about Norris Bradbury for a moment and the invention, uh, the early days of inventing the nuclear science lab. So remember, up until this point in time, Los Alamos is a nuclear weapons laboratory. Under Norris Bradbury, we evolved into a nuclear science laboratory. So we start doing other things, but pretty much all of those things are still under the nuclear science umbrella. This looks pretty good. Now, why would, uh, 
Why would you be interested in that? I mean, nuclear weapons looked like, uh, that looked like a good business to be in back in the 50s, right? I mean, America, you know, hey, the Soviets, we remember Stalin had, uh, I should mention, Stalin was likely killed in 1953, but Stalin, people still remembered that guy. People still remembered World War II, and they thought, you know, we kind of like nuclear weapons because we don't want to fight World War III, and this might be the best thing keeping that from happening. So it's a good business to be in. It looks promising, but Norris was looking ahead. Now, first of all, his reasoning was, look, it's 1955, or uh, yeah, 1955, the big weapons breakthroughs are all behind us. Now, of course, those of you who are familiar with the stockpile uh, know how much innovation came out of the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the refinements. Uh, but Norris knew there wasn't going to be another Trinity test. There wasn't going to be another first hydrogen bomb test. And you can see in his quote, now I'll read this. I don't like reading long quotes, but I think it's worth it if you can't read that to, to hear it. Although the developmental demands upon the laboratory are very heavy today, and five or ten years of very hard work can be foreseen, the future beyond that point looks somewhat unrewarding. This is in weapons work. Because of this pro prospect, and because the laboratory must have an intelligible, realistic, and exciting future for its staff if they are to remain and work on weapons now, we have increased our interest in the effort uh, and effort in the reactor field, the nuclear propulsion fields, the Sherwood field, and in basic research. That's from November of 1955. So he thinks nuclear weapons might, uh, might go away. That view is uh, further reinforced by the 1958 testing moratorium. Now, if you're not familiar with that, I do think that is worth exploring very quickly because you know, although it looked like we were really lagging behind the Soviet Union at that point in time, I don't think we were all that far behind. We may have even been ahead. And I think especially in the weaponeering field, we were really doing well. Every test that we did here in Nevada advanced our knowledge of nuclear weapons. It helped us to make weapons more efficient, safer, et cetera, et cetera. The Soviet Union was aware of the progress we were making. Now, here's the thing. You're at the Politburo. Wouldn't you love to stop the Americans from testing? How are we going to do that, though? Oh, I've got an idea. Soviet Union steps forward in 1958 and says, look, we have always been a peaceful nation. We hate war. Forget those things that you saw on the slide, all lies. Um, we hate nuclear weapons. Uh, and we are going to stop testing nuclear weapons as a first step toward a world that doesn't need them anymore because we want to benefit all of mankind. Where's my Nobel Peace Prize? So that's a pretty good speech, huh? And so anyway, they, they say, uh, this puts a lot of pressure on Washington to do the same. And so what does Washington do? We stop testing as well. And so in 1958, we enter into a voluntary year-to-year -year testing moratorium. Okay? Now, I'm going to ask you in a minute, you can be thinking about it right now, but uh, who, do, do you think that the Soviet Union is in this for the benefit of mankind? I'll ask you later. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, Norris, though, so if you've seen some of the photos and footage of the Trinity test, if you've seen that picture of the Trinity device up in the cab and there's always this guy standing by, that was Norris. Uh, underneath uh, the tower there, when the bomb was putting, being put together, he assembled all the non-nuclear parts. So, you know, you can see Oppenheimer kind of walking around in the background, and people like Louis Sloten, some of you may recognize that name as well, and Marshall Holloway. The guy doing the work with the, with the needle-nose pliers, that was Norris. He, he didn't like nuclear weapons. He was very clear on that. He said, I hate this. I, I hate these things but it has to be done. He recognized how important they were. Uh, so the testing moratorium to him, he thought this might be, this might indeed be the first step toward a world that doesn't need these things anymore. But I've got a weapons laboratory. Maybe we should get involved in some other fields as well. He did this for two reasons. If nuclear weapons went away, the laboratory would have all of these other cool programs that we could work on to benefit the nation. The other reason why, though, is we want to keep people here working hard now. Um, maybe those programs would help. Because if we do have to go back to full-scale testing, we'll still have all of the experts here. You know, we'll have all those hydrogen bomb designers, you know, look at solar eclipses or something like that. And they'll be here to call upon if we go back to testing, which, uh, which we didn't. Did we? 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, we did. We're, we're going to see. Remember that question I asked you? Does, uh, does the Soviet Union do this in the world interest? So anyway, we're going to move now from being a division-level activity, which is pretty significant, especially at that time, to have an entire division dedicated to one thing. Now we're going to move it over to an entire program. And so this is 1954, uh, well, 1955, I should say, late 55, early 56. We're going to have a problem with the program, though, in 1956. And this is going to be the start of a series of ups and downs. I'm sure no other program is like that, right? We're going to have highs and lows and budget. Whoa, I, I should write that down, right? Uh, but, uh, but anyway, our first problem is we're going to make an ICBM to deliver really big, heavy hydrogen bombs in combat. We kind of worked ourselves out of that mission at the laboratory because in 1956, we performed a test series called, I wonder if anybody knows, off the top of their head, I know I caught you cold, but it is the testing museum, right? So Operation Red Wing. And so Red Wing was, you know, in 1954, we had an operation called Castle, very important operation. These are the first deliverable, barely, hydrogen bombs. By 1956, these things are getting smaller. They're getting lighter. Do you need a nuclear rocket to deliver smaller, lighter hydrogen bombs? Nope. And so the program almost goes out of business just as it's getting underway. And at that point in time, I failed to mention this earlier, though, uh, Livermore was also interested in this business. So at Livermore and at Los Alamos, there were rover programs looking at these concepts. Now it's a low priority. It might even go away. And so the government decides, well, we're only going to give this to one lab, and they choose and I can't, I can't say anything ugly because, again, we have Livermore witnesses with us tonight. They say, well, we'll put Livermore on an important project called Pluto, and we will give the rover program exclusively to Los Alamos. And I was telling Joe back there, uh, somebody should do a talk on Pluto because Pluto was a really cool uh, project to build a nuclear ramjet. And so uh, do inquire about that uh, one of these days. So the program's barely hanging on, even just at Los Alamos by itself. Uh, so that's a pretty significant low. I think it's time for a high, don't you? And there it is. The Soviets are going to help us out. <laughs> and you will see this as well. When the Soviets do something good, it's good for business at the laboratory. So Sputnik. This is a big deal. Some of you have already read Norris's, and, and I don't, anybody know Norris personally? I bet there's a couple. So, so, so Francis knew Norris Bradbury, classic Norris. I didn't get to meet him personally, but having read a lot of his things, Sputnik rescued the nuclear rocket program, although we really didn't have one. <laughs> How are we going to meet those, those commie scumbags in the, in the space race that have put Sputnik into space? Well, uh, we could take that old ICBM delivery program with the nuclear rocket and rebrand it as a space exploration technology. And so Rover is back alive in a major, major way. Now, again, you remember that Cold War context slide that I had. People were scared. This was the Red Scare, right? The era of McCarthy. And again, the, the catalysts were real. I would be afraid, too. Uh, our reaction to that fear, not our finest moment, perhaps, as a country, but, uh, you know, what is the countermeasure for a Soviet satellite that's spotted over San Francisco? There, there's not one. What's the countermeasure for all those Soviet bombers and better missiles? Well, so, so things look bleak. And so anyway, Los Alamos to the rescue. Now that we, uh, now we finally get to a little bit of engine design, and I should warn you, Today, I've already received a couple of really good technical questions about rover rocket engines. The answer to those questions that you will have after the presentation is, I don't know. I'm a historian. I'm going to tell you the story. But, but I will try and help put you in contact with people that can explain. I mean, really, the historian explaining nuclear rocket science? A little bit of a stretch. But, uh, but I do love telling the story of this. So here's the thing. Whenever we face a great crisis, as a country, what is the first thing that we do? We create a massive new bureaucracy to solve it, right? <laughs> now, in this case, in this case, the new bureaucracy is actually a pretty cool one. We're going to create NASA in 1958. And so this was, NASA didn't exist till then, so they're part of the reaction to Sputnik, as is the new rebranded rover program. 
Now, at Los Alamos, what we decided to do was start out with a series of rocket engines that were dubbed Kiwi. Now, what type of animal is a Kiwi? It's a bird. Yeah, that's right. Is it a bird that flies? <laughs> that's right. And so that is why it gets the name. These, the, the original series, the Kiwi A's, the Kiwi B's, never intended for flight testing because, again, nuclear rocket science is really hard. Why don't we start out small? Why don't we stay on Earth? Why don't we just try and figure out what this thing should look like, the heat that is going to be produced by these things? How are we going to manage it? How are we going to keep people safe? Let's, let's practice first. And so Kiwi A and B are born. So Kiwi A is, is based largely on the old Black Joe prototype that we don't think ever left uh, paper, but it's far less powerful. Now, the, uh, the thing is, it's going to be a 100 megawatt reactor. So remember, old Black Joe is going to be 1,500 megawatts. We're going to scale it down. 100 megawatts is still a pretty significant amount of power in a propulsion uh, uh, designed rocket, right? Now, the Kiwi B, though, it's going to be a 1,000 megawatt design. So it's much larger. They're, de they're developed in tandem. You can see uh, this is a drawing, conceptual drawing, in 1959 uh, while it was under construction. I really like these pictures here. Now, hopefully, some of you remember American Car and Foundry, ACF. ACF was a company that uh, built uh, railway cars, I think is how they got started. And uh, they also built things like uh, the first hydrogen test device, the, the Ivy Mike device. They built that, and they built parts for our rover engines as well. And so this picture was taken, I believe, in Albuquerque. I think their main office may have been in Buffalo, as I recall. Now, here's the uh, part where I'm going to get in trouble, because I'm going to be talking about the facilities. And as Fate would have it, we have several experts on the facilities here tonight, so they will be able to correct me on anything that I get wrong. But uh, here's the thing, we're talking about building a thousand megawatt nuclear rocket engine. Is anybody going to volunteer their backyard to test it? The nation has a pretty cool backyard though, right? Not far from here. And so, you know, we're testing nuclear weapons and uh, weapons concepts in Nevada. Uh, we will set up our facility for testing nuclear rocket engines there as well. And so it's in Area 25, right down there where you can see Mercury's over off in that direction. Which, uh, but Area 25, where we're going to do the nuclear rocket work. The, the facility as a whole, if you will, was called the Nuclear Rocket Development Station. I've been asked before, nerds. Is that where the term nerd comes from? I'd like to say yes, but I think that that term actually predates this. But, uh, but anyway, I think we should claim it anyway, because it's, it's cool. Uh, one of the main, a couple of the main facilities here, first of all, RMAD, which was the Reactor Maintenance Assembly and Disassembly uh, Building. So that's where a lot of the action is going to go down. We're going to assemble engines there. We're going to take them apart and analyze them after tests. And so that's a pretty significant building. And uh, so keep in mind, people are going to be there. All right, remember that one. People are going to be there. We're going to have test cells as well. And so just today, thanks to uh, some of my friends at DRI and to, and to Joe, I was able to confirm a story. So we built test cell A two miles away from RMAD to fire these things up. Uh, there was also a test cell C. I think that we'll see a little bit more about that in a little bit. Test cell A was the area, the kind of the early, to use our term from our meeting earlier, kind of the early workhorse area of the rocket program, but that would become test cell C as time went on. And I've always wondered, well, what about test cell B? Well, and I had, you know, I asked around, I got a good answer today. Well, before it was known as test cell B, the Livermore folks took it over and they used it for Pluto. And so I was given that answer today. So there was a, uh, so anyway, that's what I believe happened. And again, we'll hopefully have some time for Q&A in a little bit. And uh, if there are any refinements, or hopefully I didn't butcher that. Now, here's the thing. It's two miles from RMAD to test cell A. Why so far away? Safety, right? We don't want anybody really close in case something goes wrong. So remember that one as well. You don't necessarily want to be really close to a nuclear rocket engine, okay? And distance is going to be our main safing feature. We're going to have a little train track there, and the train will carry the rocket engine from RMAD by remote control out to the, uh, or back by remote control especially, to the uh, test cell. We're going to fire it up, see what happens, and then bring it back for a post-mortem analysis. And so that is our, our, our area there. And I've got good news for you. 
The momentum that we have built up is going to continue. Our facility is, uh, for testing is completed in 1958. And uh, we do our first full-scale test of a Kiwi A, July 1st, 1959. Think about how quickly that, that, that happened. We went from saying, okay, let's do outer space research with this thing in 1958. July 1959, we have a successful test, and you get to see it in this film. The date of the historic event you are now witnessing is July 1st, 1959. This test and those that followed established beyond all doubt the feasibility of applying nuclear power to space propulsion. Hey, I think that deserves a round of applause. Right. Okay, so we are, we're doing well so far. This is a really good start to the, uh, to the project. Oh, saw the video. Which means, of course, we've got to have a setback now, right? Now, let's go back to great national crises. So Sputnik is launched in 1957. Well, that's intolerable. We can't let the Soviet Union have one of those and, and, and not us, and we got to beat them in space. How long does enthusiasm usually last after a great national crisis? A few months, maybe. I mean, you know, and then it kind of fades, and it's like, ah, you know, no big deal. Well, that's kind of the issue here. It's now 1960. We've had a successful test, and we're already thinking, well, Ah, we don't really need this stuff, do we? Now, uh, here's the thing. So because of that, because, you, you know, the 50s, the 50s were a pretty prosperous time. The suburbs are being created, but the 50s were not without recession years. And so the budget is down in the late 1950s a little bit. We've got to start counting our, 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 our pennies because, and everybody stay seated because you're not going to believe this, they kept a balanced budget back then. They tried to. They did not like deficit spending. I, yeah, I know, I know, you know, but uh, but anyway, so uh, so yeah, we should be responsible with the taxpayer dollars. We're going to have to make some cuts somewhere, and so anyway, we start to see cuts to the uh, to the program. Of course, along with the cuts is we started out with Kiwi A, and that was great. Kiwi B, uh, Kiwi A is a long way away from something that you can actually flight test. Now, as we get closer to something that you might be able to flight test, what happens to those technical challenges? They get harder, don't they? I, I mean, think about this. We're trying to build, uh, you know, 1,000-plus megawatt engine, ultimately a 10,000-megawatt rocket engine. Uh, this is really hard to do. You know, you're going to have a, a, a graphite-moderated reactor. Uh, how are you going to protect that from the hydrogen for extended periods of time? How are you going to survive startup after startup <laughs> after startup cycle? You know, and, and how are you going to do those things with 1959 technology? It's mind-blowing when you think about this. Uh, for, for me, as a historian, I can only imagine for those of you who are in technical fields to think about the reactor science that went into this. And so anyway, at this point in time, we are, uh, we're, as we try to overcome this problem, we're going to try different configurations. We are going to invent new materials and new techniques for applying materials to protect our graphite and things like that. They're going to build Kiwi A, and you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, I thought it was a successful test. Well, what these rocket engines do, they, they're just like your car engine. If you take care of your car engine, it can last a very long time, but it ain't going to last forever. And that's the same with these rocket engines, except this is a much more hostile environment. So we want them to last a certain amount of time, certain amount of fire-ups. And I forgot, somebody will ask me later, I forgot the exact numbers, but those are something that I can get to you if you're interested, our, our goal for the reactor. So anyway, of course, some damage is caused when they fire up Kiwi A. So they rebuild it. They test it again a year later in July of 1960. They're starting to build other Kiwi A series reactors as well at that point in time. They fire up the A3 in October of... Uh, uh, 1960. Fuel elements are heavily damaged, uh, but because of refinements that they had made, you know, each time it gets a little bit better. And, and isn't that kind of how science works, right? You try something, it doesn't work out, you learn, you apply a fix. You know, stuff like this does not happen easily overnight. Uh, but sometimes our friends in Washington want them to. And there's, uh, that's when we enter the negotiation phase, right? And so anyway, that's what's going on. But well, actually, one of my most favorite parts of the story here, you see the JFK campaign poster there from the election of uh, 1960. Now, 
I know that politics would never enter into our, you know, the budget process or anything like that, right? So here's the, here's the thing. Those of you, who's been to Los Alamos before? Okay, you know when you're driving up like the main hill road for the first time? You remember the first time? You, I remember the first time I drove up there in a Chevy Astro van when I was moving full of stuff. I was scared coming from West Texas. I mean, like a, a foot drop off. This is a big drop off in West Texas. I'm driving up the main hill road in Los Alamos. Now, did you stop and take your picture there at the, the overlook, right? And there's a little plaque there. And if you stop and you read that plaque, it refers to a person which that site is named after. Does anybody know who that site is named after? And actually, there's an, our particle accelerator facility at Los Alamos. Uh, the, today, it's known as the Lance facility. Back in the old days, it was the LAMP facility. Is named after the same person. So if you have no idea, first of all, first of all, who do we name things after? People that do things important, like politicians. <laughs> right? So everything's named after. So I think I heard somebody say president, not the president here, but any guesses? It's the overlook. Yes, somebody said that. So, so non-redeemable bonus points. Uh, sorry, <laughs> but bonus points nonetheless, whoever said that. Uh, it's the Anderson Overlook. So it's named after both those facilities, named after Senator Clinton P. Anderson. Now, I don't suppose you know which party he was a member of. I mean, you've got like two choices in this country, right? Uh, <laughs> So he's a Democrat, all right? So he's a Democratic senator from New Mexico. What do senators, regardless of their party, like to do? That's right, they like to spend, and where do they like to spend it? That's right, and that's why we name things after them, hence the cycle, right? And so Senator Anderson, does he want to bring money to New Mexico? Does he want to bring money to Los Alamos? You bet he does. He's a Democrat, so is JFK. And so the Democrats, I think because of a lot of lobbying from Senator Anderson in particular, they thought, you know what, this is so cool. Not only do we support nuclear rocket development, but we are going to mention nuclear rockets specifically in the party platform this election year. So who do we want to win? Right? Because Senator Anderson likes this. Vice presidential candidate Johnson, LBJ likes this too. JFK really didn't care, but he went along with it. And of course, he wins. And so we've had a year of limited progress. Things are going to get better. Don't worry. Now, uh, before they do, though, I just uh, put this in there because I think that's so cool. 1961, this is what our spaceship is going to look like. Really big spaceship, I imagine full, f uh, mostly full of hydrogen fuel. And here's the rocket engine. Now, the, uh, we had a caption contest for this. And the winning caption, you see the little astronauts here, the winning caption was, Fred, didn't they have the engine two miles away from people at Nevada? Uh, but anyway, very, uh, very cool stuff. Now, we get to another Cold War contextual slide uh, very quickly. So we saw that hot spot in the Cold War in 1949, 1950. You remember all that stuff that happened? That's going to happen again in 1960 and 1961. Well, really, 61, 62. May 1960, uh, don't, don't look at that. It was a weather plane. One of our weather planes straight off course over the Soviet Union, it happens, uh, was shot down. And, uh, and of course, Gary Powers, his son, will be visiting here before long, as you heard from Jordan. Uh, he was captured, and the plane was captured largely intact as well. Okay, so we got caught spying on the Soviet Union. Come on, everybody does it. Uh, this was a big scandal, right, because we got caught. Less than a year later, April 12, 1961, Yuri Gagarin is the first person in space. So it still looks like the Soviets are really making us look bad. Oh, and that week wasn't any better. The same week that Yuri goes into space, the Bay of Pigs happens. Don't have time to talk about that story, but really shortly, uh, well, let me do mention this. So the United States versus Cuba. Who's going to win, Cuba or America? <laughs> Who said Cuba? Where's the FBI? You know? America's going to win, but what might happen as a result? World War III. So we don't want to do that, because the Soviet Union, you might launch nuclear missiles at us. So, um, so we decide, hey, we'll train a bunch of Cuban exiles to go in. We will deliver them, and they can go overthrow the, uh, the, the country so we don't have the Castros and communism, you know, 90 miles south of Key West. 
This is an Eisenhower plan executed by the Kennedy administration, and it is a complete debacle. So now we've been caught spying. We're behind in the space race. Uh, we have been caught trying to overthrow a communist uh, neighbor. Uh, so things are not going well. That's the spring of 1961. In August of 1961, the Berlin go Wall goes up. You know, I never understood those communists. Why would they want to leave that superior society that they had? I can think of a lot of reasons, can't you? And so anyway, the Soviet Union, they couldn't understand why, and so they built a wall to keep people from getting out for their own good, right? Uh, so, uh, so anyway, the Berlin Wall goes up, starts going up in August 1961. That wall went up fast. And uh, here, the Soviets. Now remember my question before? The Soviet Union, does it do things for the benefit of mankind? No. Why all the negativity? Oh, okay, you're right. You're right. Yeah, they're not doing it. What were they doing? 1958, 59, 60. Well, I think it became pretty clear they were preparing one of the largest test series ever conducted. Because the last day of August, they call us and say, hey, uh, comrades, uh, we're going to resume testing tomorrow. Sorry. And they detonate something like 57 devices over the next 65 days. I'm sure they decided to just do that on a whim, right? And so, uh, so anyway, we resumed testing on September 15th, 1961. The culminating, one of the culminating shots of the big Soviet series was a test of a device called the Tsar Bomba, which you see right there. Now, our largest test, you saw Castle Bravo earlier. Castle Bravo is about 50, or I'm sorry, about 1,000 little boys in a deliverable case. Think about that for a minute. This is about 3,500-ish little boys in a deliverable case. And it was designed to produce a bigger yield. I, I think that the pilot insisted, of the plane that uh, dropped it, insisted on dialing it back just a bit. But anyway, this is October of 1961. And of course, October 1962, probably the seminal event of the Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Because it looks like, you know, anybody seen the uh, Bert the Turtle duck and cover video? It was all fun. It's like a little break in the middle of class. Well, not anymore. Now it's real. It looked like we were going to go to nuclear war, and there was no way around it. It looked inevitable. Fortunately, of course, uh, the Soviets, uh, Premier Khrushchev, President Kennedy, they made a deal, backed away from the nuclear abyss, but not before everybody was really scared. Now, I uh, don't have time for it today, but just I will mention, one October after that, the Partial Test Ban Treaty is signed. And I think largely due because uh, Los Alamos developed satellites called Velas that were launched one week after that agreement went into effect to verify it. It was a real treaty, and we had technology to back it up. But that's a story for another day. Back to Kiwi B. We talked about Kiwi A for a little while. Uh, back here to B, remember, we're going to build a 1,000 megawatt practice reactor, just a little one. The, the real one is going to be the 10,000 megawatt reactor. Uh, so B1 and B2s, they're basically variations on the same design. But the revolutionary new design was going to be the B4. It was going to be smaller. It was going to be more efficient. Uh, it really looked like it might be the prototype of the prototype that would be the prototype for flight testing. <laughs> so we're getting closer. Uh, the B1 here, very quickly. It's moving forward, it's, uh, you know, but now we're gonna have another setback. Things are starting to look up again, but we have some accidents and nothing will set you back like an accident. It's always been that way, it certainly was back at this point in time. There was a, uh, an explosion, I believe, uh, during this period. There was also a hydrogen fire, which is never fun to uh, work with. Fortunately, uh, nobody was killed, to my knowledge, but there were injuries sustained in both of those accidents. So that's going to slow things down uh, just a little bit. But, uh, but anyway, they were still able to do a test December 1961. Okay, so this is not long after the Tsar bomb, but going back to our previous slide. So they fire up a, a, a B-1 reactor, test it at 300 megawatts, 300, so we're making steps, and it was marginally successful. So if you're back at NNSA or DOE, that's a term that you want to see, right? Marginally. Yeah, nobody's, nobody's, that's like the least enthusiastic word ever, isn't it? Marginally. So we don't like that word. Uh, now, we've had accidents. We've had a marginally successful test. Uh, and we've resumed nuclear testing, which fortunately is really cheap and easy, right? 
Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's going to be a problem too. So now that we're testing nuclear weapons again, that's costly and that's going to take a bite out of the space program. Oh man, things are not going well. So uh, remember, the Democrats have won the presidential election. We have friends in the Democratic Party, uh, but we've got some enemies too. Some people in the party are saying, look, we don't have money for this. It's probably not even going to work. Well, just cut it now. And so anyway, even in the, among the Democrats, we're starting to see some uh, opposition to that. But what kept Rover alive, ironically, were Soviet space advances. Every time, the, every time the program's about to go out of business or run out of money, the Soviets do something really cool. And when they do something really cool, the money and the priority come back into the laboratory. Now, September 12th, 1962, I'm going to show you a visit, uh, video, I should say, in just a moment. This is, not, uh, this is not long before the Cuban Missile Crisis, just a couple minutes, uh, a couple months before that uh, started. He publicly announces the goal of a lunar mission. Now, before I show you this video very quickly, do we have any uh, alumni from uh, the University of Texas or Rice University here? Nobody? Okay, well, that's too bad because you would enjoy this if you were either of the, from either of those schools. This, uh, this film, uh, President Kennedy made this speech at the University of Rice that September, and let's see what he has to say. Come on, President Kennedy, but there you go. Why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. And one we intend to win, and the others too. I'm pumped. I'm ready to rock and roll, and we woke up everybody who was sleeping. My apologies for that. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, we're going to go to the moon. We're going to stick it to the Soviets, right? Uh, we're going to go to the moon first. We're going to take the lead in this. Now, um, here's the thing. Do you need a nuclear rocket to go to the moon? No, you don't. Uh, we're going we're gonna to have the Apollo program to do that. So why don't we get rid of Rover? Because we want to we wanna super stick it to the Soviets. We're going to go to the moon, and then shortly thereafter, we're going to put somebody on Mars with our nuclear rocket engine. So take that. So that's what the rover program is going to be there. You know, the moon, small potatoes. We're going far beyond the moon, hence my clever title, which I stole out of an article. Uh, but uh, anyway, more on that later. And I should mention, I don't show the bibliography to this at the end, but uh, some people have done some research on this. Do take note of them, especially James Dewar, or Dewar, I don't know how he pronounces his name. He did a thesis and eventually a book on this that was hugely helpful in putting this together for you tonight. Okay, sorry, President Kennedy. If you're thinking, man, I'd kind of like to see that again, don't worry. I've got more Kennedy footage for you. So, uh, so anyway, the B-4, remember the B-4 is going to be our big breakthrough reactor, or well, our little breakthrough reactor, more powerful, more compact, uh, more efficient. One of the reasons that we like the B-4 is that it's scalable. So if we can get it to work at 1,000 megawatts, we can just make everything a little bit bigger and make it work at 5,000 megawatts. So that, uh, that sounds pretty cool. November 30th, 1962, the nuclear, or I should say the Cuban Missile Crisis is pretty fresh in our minds at this point, right in time, right? This is shortly after the Cuban Missile Crisis. We're going to fire up the B-4A, and, well, it's not going to look good. When you watch this film, look for the flashes in the plume coming out of the, uh, of the engine. On November 30th, Kiwi B-4A was ready at the test cell once again. Early in the test, ejection of material indicated core damage. The run was terminated by reversing the startup program after the reactor had attained a power of approximately 500 megawatts. Post-mortem analyses revealed much damage to fuel elements near the hot end of the core. 
The damage was attributed to excessive vibration from hydrogen flow and insufficient lateral support. Well, that didn't sound good, did it? You know those flashes that you saw? You know what that was? It was the rocket shaking itself apart and shooting bits of itself out the back. That's not what you want. So this is bad. Now, the thing is, before, uh, before I talk about this next slide, let's see. Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah, I forgot. So there's a cutaway if you're interested in seeing what these look like side by side. And before I talk about the next slide, I should mention, so everybody's seen Star Wars, right? You know where they're working on the Death Star and Darth Vader saying, why isn't this done yet? And they're like, we're doing everything we can. And he's like, well, you're going to have to tell it to the Emperor. Remember that scene? The Emperor? He's coming here? Yeah, well, we've just had a bad nuclear rocket test. Guess who's coming to visit Los Alamos? <laughs> so, uh, on this next slide, this is going to last about a minute and a half. I'm sure that sound is good, right? We're not going to have like a, one of those, man, you know, forced restarts or anything like that. What could go wrong? But uh, if you'd like to stand with me, well, you don't have to. But uh, since I'm the corporate historian, I do. You will get to enjoy the Los Alamos March at the beginning of this. I've dubbed it that. I don't know if it's actually called that, the music. But you will get to see President Kennedy at uh, Los Alamos. He's come to inspect the nuclear rocket program. And, uh, well, uh, it's, you'll notice also it's the anniversary of Pearl Harbor as well. Before entering the classified portion of the rover exhibit, Dr. Bradbury outlined for the president the major areas of research engaged in by the laboratory. With this group is Dr. Glenn T. Seaborg, chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission. Wing 9 was divided into two exhibit areas, one unclassified and the other classified. The area shown is the unclassified portion and was later open to the press. It is separated from the classified area by 10-foot high curtains. Included in the various displays for the president to view was a full-size cutaway Kiwi B4 reactor. This was so oriented that the cutaway portion, revealing the reactor core, faced the classified area, and the other half was open to the press so that they might have a close-up view of what is destined to become the first nuclear rocket engine. And there are no group of people in this country whose record over the last 20 years has been more preeminent in the service of their country than all of you here in this small community in New Mexico. We want to express our thanks to you. It's not merely what was done during the days of the Second War, but what has been done since then, not only in developing weapons of destruction, which by an irony of fate helped maintain the peace and freedom, but also in medicine and in space and all the other related fields, which can mean so much to mankind if we can maintain the peace and, in and protect our freedom. And all the other related fields, which can mean so much to mankind if we can maintain the peace and protect our freedom. Oh man, I'm excited. I love this guy. <laughs> we love JFK at Los Alamos, and I, I bet some of you here have been to the football field there, and maybe if you bought a ticket there at the uh, little ticket booth, you've noticed why is there like a bust of JFK on the ticket booth at our football stadium? Well, it's because he gave a speech there. And so there at the football field, that's where that took place. Now, I'm excited. I'm ready for a breakthrough. Uh, the emperor has come to visit, and so let's, let's deliver. All right? So... Uh, we're going to have a series of successes here. Now, the first thing they did in May 1963, they fire up a B4, the B4A to confirm vibration was the main problem. Remember, this thing is shaking itself uh, apart, and they proved that it was the problem. So the B4B incorporates improvements that we've learned from the unsuccessful test, and it's successfully tested in August. Two more Kiwi reactors have built and tested, the D and the E, and they're both successfully tested. And look at our numbers down here. In August, the B4E ran for eight minutes at 900 megawatts. 
uh, we've made a big jump here. And again, this is not with technology from the 21st century. This is early 60s technology and they've got this to work. And uh, you'll get to see it now. The video, this video is glitchy and it's my fault uh, here. So I apologize for that. But I want you to see this. The full power run, run of the B4E 301 was conducted August 28, 1964. The major objective of the test was to run the reactor just below full power for as long as the liquid hydrogen storage capacity would allow. The reactor operated smoothly throughout the run with none of the problems that plagued earlier runs. Maximum fuel element temperatures of 4,300 degrees Rankine were achieved with a maximum calculated thermal power of about 937 megawatts. The full power hold was halted after eight minutes when the supply of liquid hydrogen had been depleted. That's pretty cool. So we, we have delivered, we're well on the road here uh, to success. And I wasn't kidding, that's the video that's supposed to mess up. And it didn't, but the other ones did. So, somebody's messing with me. Uh, but, but anyway, who's ready to go to space? I am. But as you all know, if we've had a big success, what's gonna happen next? Oh man, all right, so. Anyway, you can see a NERVA exhibit here uh, at the museum. Basically, the NERVA, so we're, we're working with Kiwi A flightless birds, right? They're not going to be flight tested. They're not going to go to space. The NERVA engine is actually going to be the, kind of the prototype model of this whole apparatus. We want to develop an engine to be a part of NERVA. And so it was hoped after the successful test that flight testing could begin in 1967. But that didn't happen. I think that although the rover program would stay in business for nearly another decade, this wound that is about to be inflicted upon it would eventually prove fatal. 1964, what's going on? All kinds of stuff, right? And so you can see the picture over there. The conflict in Vietnam is just starting to grow a little bit. And as we all know, it's going to grow into a pretty big conflict. Fighting conflicts on the other side of the world, cheap or not? Yeah, that's kind of, you know, that costs money. What about the Apollo program? Sending somebody to the moon, cheap or not? Yeah, that's super expensive as well. Unfortunately, President Kennedy's been assassinated at this point in time. We have a new president, Lyndon Johnson, and his big social goal, we're going to eliminate poverty, we're going to create the great society, is eliminating poverty, or trying, cheap? No. So we've got all these things going on, and we have a finite amount of money. So we're going to have to start making some cuts. Now remember, LBJ kind of thinks this program's cool. It's not on like his top 10 list, but he thinks it's nifty. Uh, and so he does not get rid of the, the, the program, but he does cut it back. And he says, look, keep working on all this stuff. That's great, but I'm not going to promise you that you're going to be able to flight test ever. I mean, I, I don't know. So we had a mission. We're going to flight test a nuclear rocket engine. That mission has been taken away, and we've simply been told to keep designing stuff and testing it. So that's a big deal when your mission's taken away, right? Even if you're allowed to keep working. So that, I think, would ultimately prove fatal, because it makes Rover an R&D project without a real mission. And so, uh, so anyway, we are going to keep working. Now, I don't know, are there any are there any crit safety people here? No crit safety? Now, I did this talk at Los Alamos for our crit safety folks, and that's a tough job. I mean, you know, it's not an easy job, and, uh, you know, they, they, they can't, uh, they, they don't do stuff like this anymore, really. Now, when I showed the crit safety people the video that you're about to see, they went from this to this. Because back in those days, you could take a nuclear reactor out to the test site and intentionally blow it up to see what would happen. And that's what you're going to get to see in this video. Because this is a safety issue, right? What happens if you build a nuclear rocket? We're going to send it to space. There's an accident. What happens when a nuclear rocket blows up? That, that could create a problem. So why don't we practice and see what will happen? We have Kiwi TNT, TNT standing for transient, uh, where is it on here? Transient nuclear, it wasn't nuclear. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so anyway, who wants to see a rocket blow up? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. 
and uh, you get more non-redeemable bonus points if you can tell me who's responsible for the soundtrack. No, good guess. No, another good guess. Yes, Pink Floyd, so whoever said that first. Now, as you watch the nuclear rocket engine blow up and you're thinking, well, how did Alan get the copyright for that? I did, trust me, no need to contact Pink Floyd for this. They're totally on board with it. Um, we thought that it was really the perfect piece to, to put this to, right? Those of you on the front row might want to duck. Look out there, see, there we go. And the film ends and the crit people go back to, oh, I was born too late. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, that is Kiwi TNT and that ended with a bang, the Kiwi series of tests. Now we get into kind of the final phase of the talk, although uh, I'm going to use my last 20 minutes or so, full 20 minutes, we'll see what we can get out of this, about, to tell you about something that is truly remarkable, and that is the Phoebus test series. Now remember, we can't flight test, but we can keep working. We can keep designing. We can keep testing here on the ground. Now that we're done with Kiwi, the Phoebus series comes around, and these are prototypes for flight testing. These are things that you could adapt if they work to do a real flight test with. So this is really exciting stuff, and it is entirely successful. Look at the numbers up here with me. June 25th, 1965, the 1A runs for 10 and a half minutes at over 1,000 megawatts. No problems, no explosions, no bits being shot out of its back end, right? It's good. The 1B runs for, uh, runs for 30 minutes at 1,500 megawatts in 1967, the year that we were supposed to be able to start flight testing, but that was taken away from us. I would argue, you know, of course, Los Alamos is, of course, synonymous with the Manhattan Project. Uh, it was our mission during World War II to design, build, test, and help deliver nuclear weapons. We were a small piece in terms of personnel of the Manhattan Project. We probably get more credit than we, than we should. But, uh, but that's what we're really known for. We've done a lot of other stuff since. And I would argue that on our short set, you know, I can come up with a big, you know, quadruple trilogy, whatever, of greatest hits from the lab. I could do that. But if we're going to go with the short list, what are we going to put on the 10-track album of the very best? This one's going to be way up there at the top. Phoebus 2A, 4,080 megawatts for 12 minutes, June, 20, uh, June 26, 1968. Built a 4,000-plus working nuclear reactor, and we ran it till it ran out of fuel. This is something, again, that could have been adapted for flight testing. They wanted to put somebody on, the Mar on Mars in the 1970s. How are we going to do that? Well, with something like this. Well, it works. You know, a lot of times I will hear people say, well, yeah, I don't, I don't really know anything about Rover, but they did like something with, I don't know, nuclear energy, and it didn't work, right? It did. <laughs> we, we did something incredible in this program. Uh, this was, and I know that when you talk with thermal rocket people versus nuclear engineers who do reactors for the production of electricity, you can get a debate going on this, but depending on how you define it, this was the most powerful individual reactor of any type ever built. And again, it worked, and you can see a picture of it in action. The other thing that you can see here at the Atomic Testing Museum is that vessel, well, you can't see the vessel right there because it's really small, but that vessel, the Phoebus 2A, is on the other side of that wall. So next time you come visit, get your picture taken with it like I did, right? I mean, this is, this is just awesome, awesome stuff. Uh, a couple of pictures as we go through here, just because I like these pictures. Here is your lineup of nuclear rocket engines from Los Alamos. Uh, here's a picture that we stumbled upon in the archives a few years ago. Uh, and I thought this was kind of neat. You see Norris Bradbury there talking with Raymer Schreiber and Herder von Braun, Mr. V1 and V2, coming out to check out our nuclear rocket engines. Uh, he didn't help us with this. We did it without help 
from the Third Reich. So uh, here, let's go to, well, it's a fair statement, right? Uh, so you have just changed history. What are you going to do for a follow-up? Well, we can't flight test, so let's make another one. And so we make another working nuclear reactor. This one's Peewee. It's, a, it's much smaller than Phoebus, but it worked. It was tested in 1968 as well, uh, successfully. It produces an exit temperature of 2750 Kelvin. Uh, uh, that's really hot. And again, when you're talking about materials and things like that, oh, did I, did I turn off? Maybe. Did I run out of battery? Maybe. Can you still hear me? Yeah. I'm loud. <laughs> We're going to the backup. All right, I'm back. Hey, thank you, Alexia. Hey, help with technical support. Look at all this stuff. So, keeping us in the game as we as we finish things up here. So, Pee Wee works as well. So it's another rack, uh, record. And uh, here's the other thing. This, this little rocket that, uh, or a relatively small rocket that was developed to test components, it was a test bed. Well, they figured out, you know, we could make a few changes to this and it would work for orbital and moon missions. So it's versatile, it works. Uh, things are going pretty well, we don't have our mission. Uh-oh, uh what do you think is gonna happen next? We're finishing up 1968, 1969, maybe some would argue the most significant historical event ever. Yep, yep, more points. More points, there it is. Now this is really cool. And I will say this, you know, I have no problem with people saying that, you know, it was a moment that transcended America. Everybody on the world came together. This was a human accomplishment. I have no uh, problem with that really, except yeah, it was an American accomplishment. <laughs> we did that as a nation. This is a special place. We did something incredible. People from all over the world have come to this country over its history, and we did this. This is an American accomplishment. Uh, the metric system did not do this. But anyway, as we, uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna get in trouble for that one. I'm just, just having fun, trying to keep everybody awake here on a Friday night. So anyway, here's the thing. As we think back on Apollo, that was a really big deal. Um, who's excited about going to Mars now? Everybody is. We've landed on the moon. That was incredible. Let's go to Mars. Everybody's excited about it. Maybe this is our chance to get our mission back. Uh, maybe, maybe keep your fingers crossed. Well, uh, anyway, uh, we're not immediately given our mission back. So what do we do? We keep developing successful nuclear rockets. The next one is gonna be called the Nuclear Furnace, which sounds more like a death metal album or something like that. But, uh, but anyway, uh, the Nuclear Furnace is, is, is uh, even smaller uh, than, uh, than Pee Wee was. It's going to be kind of a test bed as well, and it's successful. And it could be adapted also for uh, relatively small missions, orbital missions, and missions to the moon as well. They do a test of this in the spring of 1972, and it was pretty impressive. I mean, we're really on a roll here. So are we going to get our mission back? I wish I could say that we were, because we might, who knows, we might have put somebody on Mars in the 1970s. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, no, we're not going to get our mission back. Um, you've seen, not only did the laboratory build a working nuclear rocket engine, we made three nuclear rocket engines. Uh, the, the thing, though, is, though, as you saw, up and down, but there are so many up and downs here. We were dealt that critical blow of having our mission taken away all the way back in 1964. Uh, when everybody got excited about going to Mars in, in 1969, 1970, the government was excited too. They thought, you know, let's do this. Let's start crunching numbers and see how much it's going to cost. Yeah, that's what did it. So the costs are really high. The budget is not. <clears throat> And so we're going to have to make some tough decisions as a nation. Now, as you're going to see, my friend Dick Malenfant, who started us off, this is a video up here. He's going to tell you about the day he found out that the program was canceled. Uh, it was canceled. He'll talk about the reasons why, but uh, again, priorities had changed. We had made it to the moon. We've got new crises here in the 1970s. We've got safety problems that we need to deal with. We've got environmental problems. We have the fuel crisis. 
we've got to get out of Vietnam. Things, things changed. So let's let Dick close us out. We'll have one, uh, one or two more quick slides yeah. after this. I can vividly recall the announcement when the program was terminated. It was the day that my son was born. Dick Toshik, the Associate Director for Research, came down to the conference room at TA-18 and announced the termination of the program and suggested that we all prepare a resume. I visited my wife in the hospital and told her that I had lost my job. I was always disappointed with the cancellation of the rover program because the hot test of the Phoebus 2A was a complete success. However, this followed the successful mission to land men on the moon, and the country was unable to support another expensive space program. Kennedy's stated goal of his inauguration was to land men on the moon in the decade of the 60s, and the country was satisfied with the successful completion of that effort. Work on the rover program was always very exciting. It wasn't a job. It was really a mission. A mission to, because there was a complete conviction of the eventual success of the mission using nuclear rockets to place a man on the moon. Dick Malinfant. Man, bummer. I hate seeing that every time I watch it. Great guy. One of the many great folks who was involved in the rover program. Um, Kind of sad looking back, isn't it? What a day that must have been. <laughs> you know, a son born in the morning and, and the project goes out of business. Now, a little bit of good, little bit of good news here. Uh, well, Dick didn't lose his job and, and virtually no one in the rover program either because as you remember, I mentioned, we've got the energy crisis to solve now. Where's the nation gonna turn to get some help? To the national laboratories. And so the original Q division is created for energy. I, I guess Q energy. Well, Q Division. And so he is in Q Division. A lot of other people go to work on reactors and solar panels and all kinds of other cool things. Uh, but uh, anyway, the rover program comes to an end. So we don't get somebody to Mars. We don't, we don't complete what we really set out to do. But uh, we do change the world with this program. You can see a list of things that came out here, uh, that came out of Rover that were very helpful to, to the nation, to the world. Saturn project borrowed technology from Rover. We mentioned some of those new materials that were being developed, new application techniques. You know, you saw those hexagonal rods in the Phoebus II reactor cutaway earlier. Those rods are about this long, not very big around, and they have many holes going all the way through that are very, very, very thin. How do you evenly coat the inside of those tubes with protectant coating? I mean, th these things were, nobody had thought about doing these things back then. All the rec records that were produced by the Rover program, try and do that today. Even today, with today's technology, what they were able to do back in the 1960s and early 70s. Uh, we learned a lot more about materials that we had known about for a long time. We found out a lot about graphite and carbon, just how far you could push them, how versatile you could be in the application uh, of using those. Now the thing is, if you're not impressed enough with all of those things, the heat pipe. Now, that's George Grover, its inventor, looking at a heat pipe in the 1960s. You might think, well, I've never heard of that before. What's the big deal? The big deal is that I'm guessing everybody here benefits from a heat pipe today. So everybody has a computer, right? Why didn't it melt on your desk? Well, because somebody invented something to control the heat that was being created by that device. You know what that thing is? A heat pipe. You know, how do we keep temperatures consistent along things like the Alaska pipeline? Heat pipes. What keeps your phone from melting? Heat pipes. And so this is a ubiquitous invention that touches the life of everybody here that came out of Rover because they had the same problem. We are producing massive amounts of heat. How can we control it? George Grover comes up with the idea. He goes to a guy at, in town named George Erickson. He says, George, uh, Look, I've got this idea for this tube and we could blah, 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 all this stuff. Can you make me one? That night, George makes one. He makes the world's first heat pipe. George Erickson's still alive. He lives in uh, Sombrio, if you're familiar with that, and he has the world's first heat pipe hanging on his wall. 
And so all of you have probably many heat pipes in your collections there. And you can see I mentioned James Dewar uh, earlier who did, his, uh, did a dissertation, wrote a book on this many years ago. Uh, the he says the nuclear rocket was not a dead-end project. What was achieved was utterly remarkable. And, uh, you know, we do have a couple of rover program veterans here in the room. We also have a, a, a Project Pluto uh, veteran as well from Livermore. What do you say we thank them? So, so again, as uh, who, I'm ready, people are ready to go to Mars. Are you ready to go to Mars? Now, by saying that, I'm not saying that I specifically want to go to Mars. When you think about that, that's probably going to be a very uncomfortable trip. Uh, but, uh, but I know there are a lot of people out there who do. The only problem is they don't have a way to get there yet. There's a lot of people thinking about this stuff right now. You think NASA's interested in the old rover program stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Natalie was telling me earlier they wanted to uh, go check out that, uh, the, the, 2A, the Phoebus 2A out there and run a camera down it and see if there's anything left. Yeah, they're kind of interested in it. Uh, we are too at Los Alamos. Now, we're not building nuclear rockets, but we are developing nuclear, uh, uh, nuclear reactors to make sure once you get to Mars, you will be able to drink water and breathe and, you know, minor things like that. Uh, this last uh, slide before we get to the credits, we'll tell you all about it. This last couple of minutes. Really cool stuff, cutting edge. One of these was successfully tested about a year ago at, oh, what's it called again? Oh, yes, the Nevada test site. And it will always be the Nevada test site to me. How about you? Yeah. We would need power on Mars for two primary reasons. The first is the astronauts need power for their habitat uh, so that they can make oxygen, we can purify water. But prior to their arrival, we need to make liquid oxygen and propellant so that they can get off the Martian surface. Kilopower is a small nuclear reactor concept that is very simple and uses a minimum number of parts in order to produce power. Power is the lifeblood of our exploration and expansion into space. The kilopower system we're testing now is enough to power many ambitious deep space missions to the outer planets, to the moons of Saturn and Jupiter, and even out past Pluto. Kilopower is the result of lessons learned over the past decades of, of trying to get uh, space reactors established. We went back and tried to make this uh, system as simple as we could. It ranges in size from one kilowatt, about the power needed for, say, a household toaster, up to 10 kilowatts. And at 10 kilowatts, we would use four or five of them on Mars in order to make fuel and to produce power for the habitat. It has a solid metal block of fuel that we fission that produces heat. That heat is used to heat heat pipes, which are, are tubes full of uh, sodium metal that we boil. And that delivers heat to what's known as the Stirling engine converter. The Stirling engine converter is a simple heat device that uses temperature differential uh, to make electricity. NASA chose Los Alamos to do the nuclear reactor design because of our long history with doing this type of work going back to the 1950s and 60s. We also have some of the world's leading experts in space reactor design. In the future, we want to take kilopower to the next step. We want to test more of its reliability and its safety and also do the types of tests NASA requires in order for a system to actually go into space. Very cool stuff, and uh, I believe Patrick was here about a year ago. Hopefully some of you got to hear him speak. Uh, great guy, great technology. Happy to report that we are back in this business working with NASA again, and I'm excited about the future, even though I'm a historian and I look backwards. So many people helped me with this. Uh, you can see some of them uh, there. A lot of my, a lot of my friends helped me put this together. And uh, last slide there again. If you'd like to find out more, these are some great sources on one of the, uh, just one of my favorite programs, arguably the uh, largest program in the history of an incredible institution at Los Alamos. I hope you enjoyed the story. Uh, and I look forward to uh, hopefully seeing some questions, answers, and corrections. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so anything before we all go to Penn and Teller? <laughs> so it's, we need some real entertainment tonight. So I think uh, we, yes? When they blew the reactor up, how did they initiate the explosion? They used a hand grenade or something? I think it was a plunger, you know, 
No, a, no I, I, don't, I don't know. That's, nobody's ever asked me that before. So the question, if you didn't hear it, was how did they initiate the, uh, the explosion of the reactor? I think, uh, now, I hate to even throw something out here because I'll get it wrong. Does anybody know? Because we do have some folks here. I think they cranked it up and just kept on, you know, reactors, when they get hot, if they're not moderated. So just push, push the piano on That would be my guess. So, so take that with a grain of salt. I may be totally wrong. I can find out. And I am easy to, to, to track down. My email address actually is the best way to get a hold of me. abcar at lanl.gov. A-B-C-A-R-R. -R. Send me an email. I, I do respond. Sometimes I can be a little bit slow. But I'll see if I can find that out. Uh, I know we had another question back here somewhere. I thought, yes. With the exhaust from a nuclear rocket uh, tested in the atmosphere be radioactive? <laughs> well, it's, uh, uh, I'll put it this way. I don't think we could do this out there today, could we? <laughs> uh, right? That would be, um, does anybody want to answer that from a scientific perspective? If you didn't hear, with the exhaust itself, you re radioactive from the, uh, from the rocket engine. I, I don't think so. Yeah, Francis has confirmed that, yeah, that's not something that we have to worry about. But uh, radio, it radiates, though. <laughs> Maybe a different story, <laughs> right? Yeah, yes. So the nuclear reactor is the catalyst, and then you still have to have hydrogen as fuel. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yes, so the hydrogen is the fuel. I believe that it was also the coolant as well as the uh, propellant, is that? So we have Joe and Francis back here to help us out. So, so you want to answer that for us? It's the coolant. It's the coolant, but not the fuel. Fuel is the radioactive material in the reactor. Okay, so the fuel is, is the radioactive material in the reactor. So the hydrogen, I mean, in a chemical rocket, isn't it hydrogen and oxidizers and those are two of the things they use? Those, I believe those are two of the things that they use in a conventional rocket. Well, so you still need to have a whole bunch of hydrogen with the other. You do. And that goes to one of the things that we are talking about uh, back there is how much fuel, how long can you keep this thing running because it's going to consume a, a lot of material. How advantageous is it then? I mean well, that's, we didn't get the flight test, so we couldn't see what could actually be achieved. And I don't know, I was talking to Joe. Now, Francis may have an answer to that. Nope, anybody? So, see, I, I warned everybody in advance. I'm, I'm the historian, I tell stories. So, <laughs> I, I'm gonna bring a, a, what's that? As if you get the thrust out of the hydrogen going out of the platform. Right, all you're doing is heating up all the hydrogen. Well, the, the, the oxidizer does that too. You don't need oxidizer. Well, I know, but I mean, what do you say? But it's, it's, it's the mass that goes down. The mass is okay, here we go. I worked on um, the, the nerve system, that big rocket. You saw in 1961. I worked on the advanced design of that. Okay, it has a big tank of hydrogen, fuels the core. What you do is it's just a heat engine. You just run the hydrogen right through the hot the heat. It heats it up and spits it out of the back. It's terrible. That's the thrust you get out of a nuclear rocket. It's really pretty simple. You just heat it up and eject it out of the back. You use the hydrogen to recirculate around the the nozzle, because the nozzle is red hot, so you need to cool it down. So you run hydrogen around. That's standard rocket technology. You've been doing that for three years. That, 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 that's it. It's really a relatively simple system. The problem has always been, it's heavy as hell, okay? The advantage to a nuclear rocket, you just take the rocket equation, it has two pieces, okay? It's the specific impulse you get out of it, which is dependent on the heat, okay? And then specific impulse, uh, it's been years. When nuclear rockets, about a thousand. Last time I saw it, maybe higher than that, I don't know. The best you can get out of a chemical rocket is hydrogen and oxygen, it's about 425. Then the other part of the equation is the weight. There's only two pieces that make the whole thing. It's the weight and the ISP, and that's it. That's the whole rocket equation. It's been known since 1890, okay? And that's what gives you all the power why the nuclear rocket is so beneficial. The specific impulse is extremely high, but the drawback is the weight. It's very heavy. And not only that, a big tank of hydrogen doesn't give you a lot of protection from the radiation you're going to get out of the reactor. That's the problem we had back in 1961. You see that huge tank? We wanted to get the people as far away as we could from the reactor because the technology didn't exist to really protect them in those days. Probably better now. 
it's really a simple system. Right. And right. So, uh, Jordan, give me a copy of that so I can memorize it and look smart the next time <laughs> I give this talk. Uh, let's, let's go ahead. Is there, there one or two more, and then we'll close it out? I, I'm guessing there will be many conversations beyond the doors when we're done here. Yes? Uh, yes. About 20 years ago, I visited Los Alamos, and they were working on an antimatter engine where they took antimatter and put it into a magnetic bottle. And they, the claim was a bottle that was as large as, let's say, a tank of, of propane, and the cylinder is about five feet tall. Mm -hmm. Would, would be able to power 747 around the globe three times. That was the claim. Do you know what the program was called? So antimatter engine at Los Alamos. I, I don't know if you can't tell already on, on that. But that, that was the, the claim was it was like about 100 times as, as powerful as that by weight as a nuclear propulsion. Well, it seemed like a great idea. Now getting antimatter. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right, so I, I, don't, I don't have an answer. I'm, I'm sorry. Somebody asked me simple questions like, what's the capital of Nevada? Las Vegas, right? Uh, so, <laughs> I know, I know, I just, <laughs> yes. no, no, that was an interesting question though. And so send me an email. I don't mind digging to try and get your answers. So yes. This is quite simple, I think. Uh, is there- So am I. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, <laughs> it's a <laughs> What was happening at uh, Los Alamos with what was being done at White Sands, New Mexico? Oh, the testing down there? Now, we, uh, I don't think that this had any connection to White Sands. I think that this was all, uh, to my knowledge, done here in Nevada. And so this was, uh, uh, you know, that's what I think is kind of neat, is that back then we had to, we've always had a cooperation, Los Alamos and Nevada, and it's kind of been reborn in the same field again as we're doing the rockets that Patrick was talking about and Dave as well. But yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know of any connection to White Sands for, uh, for this purpose. Of course, we did have a connection with White Sands back in 1945, but that's a different story for a different day. So. Yes, one last one, so. How successful was Howard Hughes in monitoring and holding back the test site tests that they did up here in Nevada? Oh, the big, the big test. Now, that would be a question better suited for probably somebody here on the museum staff. Uh, if, you, if you didn't hear it, you know, there was a controversy over doing a pretty large test at the Nevada test site many years ago, and Howard Hughes was not very happy about it. And, uh, you know, I will tell you a little bit about what I uh, have heard and then we'll see if somebody wants to correct me. I think that test went through anyway. Uh, I think that Howard Hughes spent a lot of money paying a lot of people to show that it would be a disaster for Las Vegas. They did the test and it wasn't a disaster. Is that more or less the story that, if, if those of you who are familiar with that? I was told that after he died, then the testing just went wild. And they didn't have what year, what, year did he, what year did he die? Do we know? Somebody's got a phone and can have it in there. Okay, so, so we'll say 74. Now, we, we did a lot of testing in the 70s, but I think in the 60s alone, we did 400 tests or something like that. And so testing was already, you know, when we came out of the testing moratorium, we came out of the gates fast and maintained that pace for, for several years. And, and again, 400-ish tests, in the uh, 1960s, and remember, we didn't test in 1960 or 1961 at all. So, uh, so right. So, and testing underground continued in the uh, into the 70s, but at a bit slower pace. Did I get that one? Yes, I got one. All right. So, I've had. Uh, okay, I'll take one more. I saw. Okay, this is the last one. The last one. Okay, how does the thrust compare? To a, a chemical rocket and a nuclear rocket of a similar size. Okay, do we have an answer to that if you uh, heard it back there? Do you want to answer? What's the question? So, could you say it a little bit louder? Or I'll How does the thrust compare uh, between a nuclear rocket and a chemical rocket of similar size? Thrust, I don't recall if the thrust was pretty much the same. Thrust doesn't matter. It's the amount of energy you can inject out the back, mm -hmm. okay? And that's what you get a tremendous amount of out of a nuclear rocket. The big advantage to the nuclear rocket is going to be, it'll get you to Mars fast. It gets you out of the radiation environment very quickly. And that's what you want to do. You want to get the hell out of there before it boils you. The radiation in space is what stops everything. 
Okay? It's, if you use a chemical reaction, it's going to take you about six months to get to Mars. A nuclear rocket could probably do it in half that time, or even less, because it gets so much power. Uh, it's, uh, and going to Mars is not easy. <laughs> Thank you. I owe that guy dinner back there. It's, uh, you guys have been awesome tonight. Thanks for being here. I hope I'll get to come back and talk to you again one of these days. So.